this is the case of the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The records reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys and the prosecutors are present as well. We are outside the presence of the jury. Before the break, I uh, made a record, an additional record with respect to the uh, video recording at the hospital. And I should have mentioned the specific um, numbers of the exhibits, and I didn't do that. So let me um, do that now, uh, just so that the record is complete. There, they are exhibits D-TR-78 and 79. 78 has... Um, subtitles and 79 does not have subtitles. Um, is that right, Ms. Nelson? I believe that is right. right. Okay, Mr. King is saying he thinks it's right. I think it's right as well. If you find out it's wrong, let me know. I just wanted to make sure the record was complete in that regard. And Ms. Nelson saying it's right. Um, the other thing I should have mentioned is that there is a portion of that video recording where the defendant is questioned about whether he had seen shadows uh, the night before and there's a discussion about seeing shadows and what the shadows do and I um, find that to be different than what the Wyoming Supreme Court was talking about in in Toth, T-O-T-H. Um, I think those types of statements are assertions as the term is used in the definition of hearsay because there it's someone uh, not saying I'm seeing shadows right now. It's not someone saying things that are nonsensical. Uh, it's someone uh, remembering something from the past. And the definition of assertion that the Wyoming Supreme Court at least relied on was one that comes from um, McCormick and Evidence, which is to say that <laughs> something is so, e.g. that an event happened or that a condition existed. Um, that would be like having, for example, someone on the defense's team interview the defendant during the lunch hour and ask him if he has seen shadows in the past. It would be the same kind of thing. It would be him discussing something that uh, allegedly was experienced in the past or a condition that existed in the past as opposed to someone uttering things right now as they are experiencing them uh, that are nonsensical. So uh, uh, to the extent that the video recording contains those types of statements, uh, I, I don't think that those fall within the, um, the the scope of the ruling in Toth and some of the other author authority that I cited before the lunch hour. So I should have mentioned that and I meant to do that and I forgot. Are the parties ready for the jury, Mr. Brockler? Mr. King, are you ready? Yes. Actually, before we bring the jury in, would counsel approach for just a moment, please?
Okay, let's bring the jury in, please. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury has joined us again. Welcome back. Folks, I hope you had a good lunch. Good. All right. Uh, doctor, you're still under oath. And Mr. King, you may proceed with your direct examination of Dr. Gurr. Thank you, Your Honor. Doctor, I would want to go through with you some of the statements and conversations that you had with Mr. Holmes over the course of the 28 hours of interviews that you did with him. Is that all right? Yes. Members of the jury, the uh, court has admitted the testimony of Dr. Gurr only for a limited purpose. You may consider her testimony only as to the issues raised by the defendant's plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. You shall not consider this evidence for any other purpose. All right, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Doctor, at first, with regard to that first visit uh, on December 19th, we talked uh, quite a bit uh, about that. purpose that you had Um, we talked a little bit uh, about that before the lunch break, <laughs> about um, the materials that you had going in, the limited nature of the materials, um, the uh, you know the the proximity in time to when Mr. Holmes was in the hospital, um, and, and those kind of issues. Um, during that, um, and you described his demeanor as well. Um, and that it was hard to get him to talk. Um, did you were you able to get some background information from him that was consistent with um, the information you got from his parents about his 
life, where they'd lived, and things like that. Yes. Now, is it, um, you also talked about, um, did he indicate to you that, um, um, that he basically had, a, had no bad memories of being a young child, that he had a fairly normal, happy young childhood? Correct. And when he talked to you about um, the issues that arose that gave him, that caused him to become very emotional, and I think you said it was when he was talking about this, this freezing that, that happens um, in, in high school, beginning in high school, is that right? Yes. Well, I think he's just setting up the next question. And he's repeating what, what has already been testified. And testified to. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Following that, um, did you talk to him about why he didn't um, shoot himself rather than going into the theater? I repeatedly asked him why he did not kill himself okay. through shooting or other means. And what did he say? That he could not bring himself to do that. He considered it, but he could not do it. Did he indicate whether he was afraid to do it or whether he just couldn't do it? He couldn't do it. Did you ask him what he was afraid of? He was afraid of people, he was afraid of being a failure, he was afraid of not attaining the goals that he set up for himself at the beginning of high school to pursue neuroscience and be able to advance the understanding of people with difficulties in learning and in memory. This is something that he, did. he stated at age 14 and was corroborated also by his parents that he has discussed with them. So the fear of people, the recognition that there is something very wrong with him and that something wrong with him biologically, that he's diseased, uh, was a, ma a major theme that came up uh, during those discussions. Did he um, did you ask him whether he was afraid of you? I asked him if he was afraid of me during the first interview uh, when uh, he avoided eye contact, when I felt that he looks through me, when he looked at the wall behind me, and when he became emotional and he said he's afraid of me, and he's af what are you afraid of? I'm afraid of what you might do to me. What might I do to you? And there was no response. Was this also, was this the period of time when he was, was he still uh, uh, showing that, uh, that, that kind of emotion that was un uncommon for him at that point? He was toward, it was toward the end of it. And was there any other time that he showed that kind of emotion or, or, or right during that period of time? No, the only time that there was some we covered in, the, in that context when talking about a fear and why didn't you kill why didn't you shoot yourself or why didn't you kill uh, why didn't you kill yourself shooting or any other way and he said that he couldn't I told him but you could call, you could kill others and he was a little bit shaken not the way he was before but pushed back in the chair and his eyes were wide open and um, did that conversation follow the conversation about his anxiety being around other people where he was emotional? Yes, and about the fear of me and me asking him, why didn't you, why didn't you shoot yourself? What about when you asked um, about, or did you ask right after that about um, 
how other people would feel being shot. I did. I did explore it at that time and, and repeatedly. And right after that, when his eyes were wide open and I followed, why did, how did you think other people will feel? He was like shocked that other people will have a reaction at all, that they will not want to die. If he wants, if he considers that life and death are the same, other people do not value life as well. Everybody is going to die, so when people die, makes no difference. I also followed by asking, how did you think will the families of the people feel? And he looked like shocked. This was the time that he was like sitting back, looking at his eyes. It's something he did not, he did not consider before the reaction of the people and the family members. How, how can that be? How can that be that, that, that one can go into a movie theater and, and, and shoot people and not consider the effects on the families or the people that are being shot? When somebody is in a psychotic state with a focus and accomplishing a mission that must be accomplished, that it has to be done, everything else is not thought about. And it's not that unusual for somebody in the intensity of a, a delusion and feel that this is something that has to be accomplished. It must be done not to consider anything else. Clearly, it, it's hard for me and I think for people in general to consider how a human being can be like that. But people who are seriously mentally ill do not have the capacity to do that at that time of the shooting. And, and we're going to talk about capacity uh, mm -hmm. coming up. Uh, but let me ask you this. If he'd had these intrusive, unwanted, homicidal thoughts popping into his head that he didn't like uh, since he was a sophomore in high school, so for years, um, this, this compulsion to kill, um, why did he then wait until July 20th, a date that he'd planned out, circled in his calendar, and, and made extensive plans. I mean, if he's so compelled to kill somebody, why didn't he just do it before? Before, and quoting him, it was just a thought, a fleeting thought that he was able to block, to diverse his attention from, by the computer games, by doing his homework, fi finding a refuge from being tormented by these thoughts. Consider that he's a young person, an adolescent. Most people don't have a thought like that that comes from nowhere. It is extremely disturbing. He was able to say it's a thought. It happened, let me do. What can I do to undo it, not to have it so tormenting to me? And it was several things that he was able to do. The computer games were a refuge. The doing his homework and doing it well, getting good grades, and plucking his hair continuously and not feeling any pain doing it. Plucking it from his head, from his chin, from his eyebrows. This is extremely painful if you try, extremely painful. He was totally numb to it. He didn't hurt. He just diverted his attention. So he had actions that he will take in order to put this thought uh, keep it just a thought. But it has continued for years. It has continued in the background. And when he went to graduate school, a new environment, small classes that require, require interaction with other people, require presentations, 
things have become extremely difficult for him. The realization, and this does not stop, it continued and intensified the realization that something is very wrong with him and he will not be able to accomplish what he'd have liked to accomplish in life. His life goals has become much stronger for him and his delusions were developing and be took off a life of their own. So he was, he was engulfed by the delusion and the thoughts that the only way out is to accomplish his mission. And once he said it to Gargi and to Dr. Fenton, that this is something that preoccupies him, the flood gates were open. He had to do it. There was no way out. He struggled with it for years. And he reached the point, maybe if he wouldn't have been in graduate school, but would have continued in the pill factory, you know, night shift, barely interacting with any, anybody. This would have never happened. But he did go to graduate school. He was accepted to graduate school. And it was like a storm that in some ways he tried to stop by seeking help with student helps, by helping, helping his friends who didn't do much about it except telling him that it will be okay. So you're saying going to graduate school caused the shooting? Going to graduate school does not cause shooting, fortunately. But for him, who was already on the way, if you look at the developmental curve, he was already on the way to psychosis, the graduate school experience was the last straw. He could not handle it. And he realized how difficult it was going to be for him he experienced it as a failure. It doesn't mean that in reality it was a failure. He was doing okay. He was presenting, he was going to class, he got good grades. But in his distorted perception of reality, he was not perfect. He was not getting all A's. He was having difficulties in learning the laboratory procedures. He was not at the top. There was something wrong with him. It's his perception. It wasn't his teacher's perceptions or any normal people looking at his record, but in his perception, he was a failure. And in his delusions, life was meaningless anyway. We are all going to die. Who knew if we weren't dead before we became alive? And he went this so intensified, intensification of his uh, delusion, living in more in his own world and stepping out from time to time. And then the actions to accomplishing the mission became the central part, the focus of his life, with no other people not knowing it, not knowing it. So, so is the, then the, the compulsion or, or the loss of control to do the mission, uh, meaning the mission has to be carried out exactly the way it's planned? Is that part of the psychotic delusion? Yes. If the mission is not carried out, it's not mission accomplished. So is that why we have the planning and the and wait till July 20th before the shooting takes place? Is that why it doesn't happen earlier? Yes. Sustained. Um, is that or is that not why it happened earlier? Yes, it is. Now this this um, hair plucking and and uh, and this other st and focusing on schoolwork and video games. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And, and, and so maybe you can explain that. To, because is that something he thought of? Like, oh, I'm having unwanted thoughts of homicide, and I'm a sophomore in high school. I know what I'll do. I'll pull my hair out, and that will make the thoughts go away. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. <laughs> Overruled. You can answer. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, it doesn't happen the way you said it. It's not, it's not a deliberate psychosis. It's not a deliberate process that somebody brings upon himself or herself and calculates at each step of the way, this is how I'm going to react. The thought comes, it's an intrusive, unwanted thought. I mean, trying to imagine that you're doing, you're sitting at home, trying to work on your homework, you're not in school, and suddenly the thought, kill yourself. No, kill other, kill yourself, kill other. 
and he developed his way of coping with it that worked for him. He took it away from him, namely, focus on do your homework now, and he will notice when describing it later that when he was busy doing his homework, the thought will go away. When he was playing computer game, it will go away. When he will pluck his hair, it will go away. And with this, when the thought will come, he was doing what he could do, what within his ability to do, secretively. He will not pluck his hair when other people will look at him. He will do it secretively, he will go to the side and do it, because he did not want other people to see and think that he is crazy. He, took, he was checking the different diagnostic. Remember, we are dealing with an individual with high level of intellectual functioning and in the internet available. Somebody was studying biology and wanted to do, be a neuroscience major. He knew about the brain and he began to read about it more and more and realize something is really wrong with me. And this is something that he had to hide and that's not different from other people with schizophrenia. They deny their illness. This is the major difficulty that we have as professionals, not in the criminal setting, it's very similar in the sense that people we see will say, I'd rather die than you tell me that I have schizophrenia. They deny the illness, the, the tremendous stigma and fear of it among people. And the people who develop it notice it. They know I'm losing it. Something I'm different than everybody else. And that's what he was experiencing. Now, he made a statement to you, did he not, in the course of this first interview, when you asked about a movie, did you ask him about why a movie theater? I'm trying to remember if it was uh, in the first uh, interview. What page are you on? I'm on page three of your notes from 12-19, 2012. So you are not in my report, but my written notes? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So please bear with me for a second. On 12-19. Just one second, please. Visit one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which page are you on, please? I'm on page three. Yes. Did he tell you he chose a movie theater because he liked he movies? He liked movies. This was his first response when I asked him, why did you choose a movie theater? And he said, his first response, I liked movies. Okay, now, you've read Dr. Metzner's, Dr. Reed's report, and is that right? Yes, I did. Now, he told these doctors that he chose the movie theater because there's going to be a lot of people there to shoot and kill, and it was a good place to do it. Am I... Am I misstating what your understanding of what he told them was? No, you're not. Well, how do you explain, how can we explain this inconsistency, or can we? I think that it was difficult for him in his first interview to tell me the graveness of his actions and that Later on, he did mention that the movie theater was part of the proximity to where he lived and that uh, he was familiar with it and it was a movie about chaos that appealed to him, why he selected it, but that the first reaction was, I like movies and I like computer games, which is quite, quite shocking but I do not see it as inconsistent because the same information that was provided to the other uh, experts was provided to me uh, later. Okay. So he did intend to kill people. 
And did he, did he tell you that on subsequent interviews when you asked him? He, yes, he did. And on November 18th, when you interviewed him, November 18th, 2014, did he tell you the movie theater, because it was impersonal, high chance of shooting people and felt comfortable because it's familiar? Yes, correct. Did he tell you anything about um, hallucinations during this first interview? And I'm again looking at page three. Page. Let me go back. <coughs> yeah, the, toward the end of the interview, uh, I began uh, to probe about uh, experiences, and I quote, and perceptions that other people may not experience. So you don't ask people about hallucinations, but experiences that you have that other people might not experience. And he said that he did hear, quote, noises, but did not provide details. I asked him for more details. What type of noises did you hear? Can you imitate the noises that you heard? When will it occur? He did not respond to further questions, and I raised it in the, uh, later on again. I also asked him about uh, visual uh, per uh, perceptions. Uh, he said that he saw things moving in the room when normally was there, and because it was toward the end of the interview, and I thought that both of us were exhausted, it was the end of the day, I noted that this is an important topic to come back for, back, back to, and my assessment was that he's not going to disclose more at that time. Did you later go back and re-explore that issue at a later date? Yes, also, um, during the interview, when he was looking at the back of the wall, it appeared, you know, you have to, you infer from the behavior, but when he looked with intensity toward the back of the wall and there's nothing there, I thought that there was something, that, there was nothing there. I mean, I looked back, there was nothing there. It was a bare wall that he was staring at it. I can't tell, I cannot tell, and he did not respond, what do you see? at that time, but it is something that I wanted to pursue later on. He did say later on that he saw shadows in the laboratories, laboratory, during a, you know, a laboratory procedure. He will turn his head and he will turn his head and there was nothing there. And this happened not frequently, but more than once. It is significant in the sense that it is more likely to infer or more, more likely to infer that a perception has occurred when it is motivating a behavior. Namely, if you'd have been continuing with a laboratory procedure and said, yeah, I think shadow, it's different then, I stopped. And I looked to the side, and there was nothing there. He directed this behavior. So that was a time. There were other times when we went over what happened in the, uh, in the cell, in jail, before he was hospitalized. And he reported hearing voices and seeing things at the time. And also when in the hospital, he reported that he heard voices that were talking to him, multiple, and telling him what to do, and that he saw things. And he was hiding at that time under the covers to avoid them. Okay. Um, well, did he, when he looked at the, at the wall like that, did he point to the wall and, and 
say something or demonstrate to you? I say you're looking, you're looking at the wall, right there. Was his response right there? Okay. Um, but no elaboration. I could not get more information. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned um, the um, hiding from shadows while he was at Denver Health Medical Center, and we'll get to that um, shortly here. <clears throat> During the um, second session with him, uh, was that uh, February 9th of 2013? Yes. During February 9th of 2013, um, did he tell you at some point that the world was coming to an end? Yes, he did, and repeatedly throughout the sessions, that he believed that the world is coming to an end. And I explored with him if there's going to be like a meteor that is trying, that is going to hit, you know, our planet, or anything like that. And he said this was not what he ascribed to the world coming to an end, but more then things in nature are born and die, and the world is coming to an end. We are all going to die. So um, when you explored that, was he referring to some apocalyptic event, or, or is it more um, a, a nihilistic thought that mm -hmm. there's no meaning to life anyways? Correct. Nihilistic thought rather than apocalyptic event. Now, at some point did he tell you that um, he thought he was helping people out by shooting them? Something along those lines. Yes, he did. That, that, explain that to us, please, if you can. Uh, everybody is going to die anyway. The way I feel that there's no purpose in life, other people feel too, and I'm going to put them out of their misery. Life is miserable for everybody. The thought when I told him, do you think that all people feel like you? People enjoy life. People want to live. His response was like one of those wide-eyed. Have you ever seen him give that look since that, the first few interviews there? No. Did you ever see that look in, uh, in Dr. Reed's videos? No. Have you seen the videotape of Mr. Holmes at his first court appearance when he was first brought to court that was on television when he has the red hair? I did. Does he make similar facial expressions during that court appearance as he did with the, uh, during the first two interviews with you? Yes, but during the interviews with me, because I was pushing him and was talking about topics that are difficult, uh, it was more striking seeing him face to face and talking to him with this distance uh, than to see it in court when he's one in a crowd. But this is an illustration of it, although it's, it's more striking when face to face. Now with regard to the world is coming to an end or there's no meaning to life comments, um, is that, in your opinion, consistent with some of the writings in the notebook about life having no value and not being demarcated and life's fallback to being death, things like that? Yes. And, and are, are these consistent with a delusion? Yes, with nihilistic delusions. And, 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 and is there just one delusion or is there kind of a whole construct of delusions that fit together? Can you explain that to us? Yeah, is that when delusions develop, 
by the time thou expressed at this level, it is more well formulated because the person sort of sucks in things that happen around them and thoughts and try to fit them into the delusion. And it's not done, you know, consciously or sitting down and saying, today I'm going to think about the delusion. It doesn't happen like that. The person doesn't call it a delusion. He just at more and more time gets into and more of the behavior is focused on this false framework, sort of an umbrella that is related to the end of time and the end of life, the worthlessness of life, all of this is related. So I will say that within his delusions there are its fixed belief that all that relate together. Uh, he, did you explore with him um, on the first, these first two sessions um, whether or not he acted out of anger when he went to the theater um, and, or out of hatred somehow? Repeatedly, repeatedly. Did anybody wrong you? Did you feel my question? Did you feel that anybody wrong you? Were you mad with anybody? Did you want to take revenge? And the answer was consistently no. And w was the purpose for doing that to look for a non-psychotic reason for the shooting, possibly? Correct. Did you find a non-psychotic reason for the shooting? I did not. Do you have an opinion as to whether, uh, but for the existence of this psychotic illness, um, there would have been a shooting at all? I agree. There wouldn't have been a shooting at all. Was there grandiosity in the way he described these delusions? In other words, was there some kind of self-importance there to himself? or Not at all. Was that significant or not? It is. Sometimes uh, delusions of grandeur, grandeur of a person feeling that they are, they have unique powers and ability uh, to control and rule, uh, are pertinent and lead to action, activities that they believe uh, they have special powers or special abilities. This was not evident. I, ex I examined it with him. Did you ask him what motivated the shooting? And could he tell you what the motivation was? The motivation for the shooting was to increase his self-worth. Okay. Now, during the first interview on the 19th and the second interview, did he ever use the phrase human capital with you? He used the phrase, yeah, human capital. No, later on in the, I don't think that at that time he used human capital. Uh, I'm wondering, I have to look at it. Do you remember whether or not he did? I think he did, but you know, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure if he did it already, these words or the words of to increase my uh, uh, value. But I'm not sure if he used the word human capital in the first or second. I'll have to check on it. Okay. Do the, do the different interviews some kind of bleed together bleed in your mind bit, yeah. <laughs> after all this time? Yeah. L let me ask you this. Is there, is there, a, did you find that there was remarkable similarity or dissimilarity, consistency or not, among the statements that he made to you over time and, and the statements that he's made to other doctors. We've heard about some inconsistencies. What was your general feeling about that? That it was remarkable. Uh, if you look at the overall picture and time involved and his status over time, medicated status, non-medicated status, is remar by and large, there is consistency. By and large, there is consistency. Um, and um, by and large, is there consistency with the, with the uh, record that's outside what Mr. Holmes said as well? Are, are there corroborations in the notebook and in the materials that you 
um, reviewed from his records and talking to his parents that corroborate some of the events that he talked about taking place. Yes. Did he tell you about um, having uh, Gmail chats with his girlfriend Gargi? He, he, did, he did mention, you know, Gargi and other friends that he had in his relationship uh, with her, uh, and I reviewed the chat that he had with them as part of reviewing all the records. Did he um, talk about uh, going to see family therapy as a child with a person named Mel Lipsy? Yes, he did. And, and is that something that he also wrote about in the notebook? He wrote about it in the notebook and it was confirmed by his parents. And did you receive actual records from Mel Lipsy uh, indicating that they did have therapy there? There were multiple sessions, but the actual records were not available. There was a diagnosis when he was seen, the number of sessions, dates, but there was no actual records available for me to review. Like the notes from the individual sessions? Correct. Do you know whether or not they had been destroyed or, or not? I, I believe that they have been destroyed and that's why they were not provided. The third interview, was that on May 1st, 2013? Correct. And on May 1st, 2013, well first, excuse me, there was an afternoon session in February. Um, was there not? Did you yes. go back in the afternoon? On the visit of February, um, I split it, decided to split it into two parts and have a morning session, a lunch break, and an afternoon session. Yes. So I saw him for two hours in the afternoon from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, it, did he use the phrase, a call for action? He did. Okay. And, and what was he describing when he said that? He was describing uh, the changes that he went through or the process that he went through uh, by moving from the thoughts, the intrusive thoughts about killing people and his ability to say it's just a thought and being able sort of to defend from that thoughts to a call for action taking, namely, taking steps to fulfill the mission, take action, that this is the time to get mobilized. Did he describe that he felt like it was something that he had to do? Yes. Now, during the, um, second interview that day in the afternoon, um, did he tell you that he now realizes that this is kind of crazy, that other people think that it's crazy that he will um, increase his value by uh, killing other people. Correct. And um, is that uncommon that he may recognize that other people think that, that it's now crazy that he, that he has that opinion? No, it's, it's, not, it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon especially for somebody who is going through it for a period of time, understand that something is wrong, searches for other information, and gets feedback <clears throat> from others that he has communicated with that this is something that is not normal. I mean, he heard about, there was concern on, on the part of uh, Dr. Fenton who saw him, Dr. Feinstein who saw him, they were concerned from the, his friends, you know, that he communicated with. No, none of them, when he revealed his thoughts, told him that this is great to have this kind of thought. So in, in, he heard it, and he knew it too, at some level, that the disturbance that he's experiencing is not something that anybody talks about. Did that change the fact that he still 
thought that? Did the delusion persist? Yes, the delusion persists. How I mean, I haven't seen him uh, recently, but I believe that it probably persists till today. Does that speak to the strength of the delusion that he can have that kind of insight as to what other people think and still maintain that belief in spite of all that evidence to the contrary? Delusions are extremely, as I said before, extremely difficult to abate. It's like, it's almost, it's the essence of the process of the thinking of a person. It's almost like this is what the, he devoted a big portion of his life to. And it's not something that he can say, well, I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and I'm not going to feel or think this way anymore. There's no control over the Form, forming the delusions and now it grows and grows and impacts more and more. Um, during the first interview back in December 19th, did he tell you that he thought he would wound people but not kill people? He did. He did. He did. He did. When I asked him, what did you think is going to happen there? Did he and you said before that you thought that he was having difficulty coming to terms with what had happened or something like that. I mean, this seems like a... Explain this to us. How, how, how can you think that, you, you know, that you're not going to kill people? There's no explanation for it. I mean, with the type of preparation that he has done and with the delusional goal and accomplishing of mission of increasing his self-worth, I believe more that he was trying to communicate to me to look good, to look better at that time, rather than to convey all the extent of his delusional beliefs. Mm -hmm. To look less mentally ill? Look less mentally ill, yes. Mm -hmm. And was that consistent with his presentation uh, with the other mental health professionals from your perspective? No, he did disclose to the other mental health professional who saw him later, and to me as well later, that he intended to kill people. Did he discuss with you whether he had plans to flee the crime scene? Uh, he presented different uh, alternatives of what might happen. He might be able to flee, he might be killed, or he might be captured. Um, did he indicate whether he desired any of those things or not, or whether it mattered? It didn't matter. Why? Because the most important thing for him was to complete the mission. After the May 1st, um, second, excuse me, 2013 interview, um, was the next time that you uh, talked to him in August of 2014? August 5th, 2014, yes. Did he discuss with you there his uh, um, thoughts about the um, His thoughts about his performance in school. And I think he said that he, like his perception of it seems somewhat different than the actual performance, the grades that he actually got. Can, can, does that have significance here? Uh, correct. In reviewing his grades and the comment that he's got from the professors and his report, uh, there were uh, differences, some differences. It was, what he reported is that it was uh, harder for him to perform in school 
you to invest more energy in focusing and doing it than you used to, so it was harder, and he was less interested. He was getting less enjoyment from the academic part that was a major part in his life. Academia, from early on, was very important for him. He, one of the ways that he explained to me, that he mentioned to me, explained to himself why he's socially so different from others and so isolated is because school is more important. You have to make a choice. You're a good student, you excel academically, or you socialize. And I made the choice to excel academically and not to socialize. He couldn't socialize. But this was the way that he could bear the fact that it's, he's so different and he has barely any friends. When he came, the way he explained it in graduate school is that I may, I, initially, I was doing less well in his perception because I made the decision that now I'm going to socialize, I'm going to have friends, I'm going to go out more than I did before, and academia is less important. That's how he presented it to himself, and that's how he conveyed it to me to explain some of the changes that have occurred. In, uh, occurred. But his perception was that he was failing graduate school and that he needs to withdraw from graduate school because he's not going to be able to obtain a neuroscience degree. It's not attainable for him anymore. Is that, uh, uh, is that psychotic level of thinking about it's, irra it's irrational thinking. It's irrational thinking. It doesn't reflect the true record. A healthy or norm, graduate school is associated with anxiety. It's higher level. The kids, not kids, but the young people who come there are selected. They have good grades. It's a small group. It's a level well above undergraduate. So not to get A's is not, not uncommon. I mean, and people have to adapt to it. It's much more intense. It's much more independent work. But a graduate student, a healthy graduate student who encounters difficulty will go to the professor, ask for help, will go together with other graduate students. A program will do everything they can to help a person. And that's the, I believe that it was not different at his university. His perception was that he failed and that he needs to leave. He was not told, you have to leave. He was not dismissed from graduate school. His perception was, I failed and I'm not going to accomplish my goals. Okay. Um, and I think I missed a visit, um, similar to the way you missed, I think, the same visit, putting it in your report. Uh, did you, in between May 2nd, 2013 and August 5th, 2014, did you visit him on November 18th, 2013? Yes, I did. And um, uh, during that session, did, you, did he tell you about this command voice instructing him to kill that appeared in his head at s around after sixth grade and in, in, yes. after after sixth grade usually he will describe the thoughts of kill others as just a thought that will be his words it was just a thought and asking him where did they thought come from it was in my head will be the common answer. At that time, he said that the thought at time, when it started, when it was switching from kill yourself, later on to kill other, was coming from the outside. Okay. I could not get from him, was it a voice? It was not part of him. You know, it was an outside perceived as an outside. It's not, people can have thought that are consistent with the processes and they say, I think this way. And at times, 
a thought is perceived as alien, as coming from the outside. It's not me thinking this way. So was, the, he, was he saying he heard a voice saying that, or that it was still a thought in his head, but was it not was his like, thought? It was not his thought. It was not a voice. Because I explored a male, a female, was it loud? It was a thought, but it was like coming from the outside. It might not be different, you know, from... I don't think it is that different from experiencing an intrusive thought. An intrusive thought means that it is not a thought that you are sitting and saying, well, today at 3 o'clock I'm going to have the thought, kill people or kill yourself, it just pops in, and it's intrusive, and at times when it happens, especially, my sense was that in young people, his experience is coming from the outside. It's not my thought. It just enters my mind. But it is experienced as a command. It's something that you have to do. Okay. Um, did he indicate... Did you ask him um, during that session on November 18th whether what he would have done if there was an armed, had been an armed policeman in the theater itself? You would have still done it. If there would have been, I asked him, an armed policeman at the door who has been checking people as they come in, he said, I would have continued with the mission. The mission had to be accomplished. Okay. When um, you spoke to him on August 5th then, uh, which is what I was getting into before, 2014, um, and he talked about the labs then, did you also discuss with him the weapons that he purchased? Yes, I did. And um, did he indicate that the first weapon he bought for self-defense? He said that the first gun that he got, which he showed him to Yeo, Yeo was a friend, I might be mispronouncing, I might... Yom. What? Yom. Yom, I'm sorry, stand corrected, is that he, did, he got it for self-defense, and I asked him if there were anything that were happening that he thought he needed to defend himself. And he did mention that there were some break-ins or things like that, or one of his friends at something, a, a window, a screen was slashed or what. Um, I'm not sure if this was, it happened just before that, I think it did, and uh, it was for self-defense, self yes. Did he, do you, uh, are you aware from watching Dr. Reed's videotape whether he told Dr. Reed the same thing? I know from watching the tape that he did tell Dr. Reed that what I believe, I'm trying to be accurate, that he had a, a, a knife, maybe, that he had, that, uh, and that uh, Hillary was a graduate school uh, classmate, did have and discussed within the group that uh, a screen was slashed. I believe he told this to Dr. Uh, Reed as well. During this interview, did he um, talk about the money in the notebook, in the sending of the notebook, and, and why he put money into that, that notebook? Do you remember that discussion? What page are you on? You mean the, the value? Uh, I'm on page, it's page 22 of the notes. <coughs> Burned money. There's something to Fenton. Something about an insurance card and money sent to Fenton. Do you see that? I don't see it, but I remember it, so, okay. but I, I, I don't see it easily, it's a long note. What do you remember? Uh, I remember that if it refers to the termination of uh, 
the therapy? The, of the therapy that um, uh, he was concerned about payment and that uh, that's the section, I, I don't know which, my pages are not marked okay. with, with a page, I mean there's no count on them. Okay. So, um, I'm not sure where exactly it is, if that's the money that you're referring to, of payment, if he will not have insurance anymore as a graduate student. That he said that he would. He sent the money because he would not have insurance. Insurance. As a graduate student. Yes. Yes. That's recollection. Yes. Of what he said? Yes. That's what I was saying. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And um, are you aware from reviewing Dr. Fenton and Feinstein's records whether or not they indicated to him they would continue treating him for free? They told him that they will continue treating him for free. Does that make any sense then, to you? No. No, it doesn't. Did he discuss during that s session with you um, why he bought handcuffs? Yes. He bought handcuffs so that he can keep the doors. He can tie, close the doors and so that people will not be able uh, to leave the theater. Is, isn't that a logical, goal-directed, rational thought. I mean, if you're going to commit a shooting in a theater and you want to kill as many people as possible, wouldn't it make sense to buy guns, buy ammunition, um, find a good lo a location where people can't get out of quickly, and then lock the doors so that they're locked in there? I mean, those seem like logical, goal-oriented thoughts to me. Within a delusional system, there are so they are consistent with his delusion. But if you ask me, is this logical for any person in his right mind to think? Absolutely not. I hope not. But within his delusional system where the mission has to be accomplished, all the steps need to be taken to accomplish the mission. But So within his irrational logic, I will say this was a logical step, but within the domain of healthy behavior, it's not. Mr. King, I'm sorry. Uh, one of the jurors needs a break, so let's go ahead and take our afternoon break, okay? okay? All right, members of the jury, please make sure that you follow all my admonishments during the break, and I'll see you back here at 3 o'clock. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury has exited the courtroom. I received a note from one of the jurors on the uh, question form that I've marked as number 232 that reads as follows. I am sorry I'm getting a migraine. Can I step out for two minutes to get my glasses and Advil? Uh, so I just um, decided that it would be uh, best to just take our afternoon break right now. Is there anything we need to talk about outside the presence of the jury for, from the people? No, sir. From you, Mr. King? No, sure. All right. I'll see you at uh, 3 o'clock. The court will be in recess.